Let's start talking about a new mineral species. Let's go into beryl. Now my wife came by and said, you could not pay me to learn about geology or gems today. And if that's your situation, then turn off this video. Save it for another day when you're more up to it. As for me, I love talking about gems. We know about some of the different colors that beryl comes in, which can be basically any color of the rainbow. Any color of rainbow can come in this mineral called beryl. We know about emerald as the beautiful green expensive version. Aquamarine is something you may have heard of. It's blue. Aquamarine. Then there's Heliodor. Name comes from the sun. It is yellow. Morganite is a peachy pink color. Red beryl does not have a creative name. And Goshenite is a clear version. And we won't talk about it anymore because it's not very pretty. Rumoral 2 will be the mineralogy of beryl. The things that all of these varieties have in common. And we'll start off with composition. The composition of composition of beryl is a beryllium aluminum silicate. There's six here, there's two of those. And what ends up happening is that there is something somewhat interesting about the crystal structure. This is the crystal structure from I got off Wikipedia. And what we have is these chains that end up, this would go like in three dimensions back down into the sample. But there ends up being these really long chains with these open tubes. And we can put different impurities inside of these open tubes like iron or manganese that will end up giving a color. Another thing about beryl that they all share in common is their crystallography. Right? And when I say crystallography, crystallography, we're talking about crystal and crystal symmetry. And so they've crystallized from the hexagonal system and the forms that they have end up being hexagonal prisms and pinacoids. So if we were to draw one of those right now, let's take, let's try to do that clearly. So there's our six-sided, and here's our prism, and then there's our basal pinacoid. We have an A6, no, sorry, that would be our A2, right? That rotates around and shows pinacoid and pinacoid, and then we'd have another A6 coming out the top that can rotate around six times. There are huge crystals sometimes of beryl that are found in nature up to like 10 feet across, which is a really interesting thing. A lot of times they're not quite that big. Here's a stunning version of emerald that I snagged off of Wikipedia. And if you look at it, you can see, let's see, let's put this color. You can see here one, two, three, four, five, six sides. So there's our six sided symmetry. Here's our prism, All right? Great example. What other things should we look into? Well, we should go into the physical properties that they all share. Physical properties of beryl. Properties. Number one of those will be hardness. It's a gemstone, so we expect this to be fairly high, and it is. It's an eight on Mohs hardness scale, which means it has fantastic survival ability in gemstones or sorry, in jewelry. The next thing we should talk about is density. Oftentimes, gemstones have a high density. This is not the case. Beryl has a density of 2.76 grams per centimeter cubed. This is essentially identical to normal things like quartz and feldspar. So we can't use gravitational separation methods like we could with corundum to find um, beryl. Third thing, I'll skip the third thing. Let's go on to the next aspect of beryl that they have in common, and that is geologic occurrences. Beryl forms in three different geologic environments. The first type is in granitic pegmatites. Remember how pegmatites are these residual melts, the last gasp of crystallization of a magma? And so what ends up happening so we could say residual last gasp of crystallization, where a lot of the beryllium gets shunted off into this last bit, 
enriched and therefore allowing us to crystallize beryl. Another environment where we get beryl is in metamorphic schists. There needs to be beryllium in this schist somehow. And in fact, the number one way where you get beryl is where these two things are occurring together. So if here's like our outcrop and here's a schist rock, and then this whole rock is intruded by a pegmatitic dike, let's say it looks like this, then what ends up happening is at the contact between the schist and the pegmatite, that's where we get our beryl crystallization. Our third environment for beryl is in hydrothermal veins. Veins in, let's say, in sedimentary rocks. This is how the emeralds, the famous emeralds of Columbia form, where beryllium gets enriched in the fluid, BE enriched in fluid, allowing us to crystallize this beryllium mineral. Now what I'd like to do now is walk through all the different types of beryl. And we're going to save emerald for last. So we're going to go, we're just going to call this um, Roman numeral three. And we're just going to call this the different species and not emerald. A is going to be aquamarine, our blue variety of beryl. And, and most of the time, it is a sky blue. It can be darker than that or lighter than that. The darker it is, darker equals more money. Okay, because it's more saturated and, it's, and it looks better in jewelry. There tends to be a color, let's see, how do we say this? The color is produced by iron 2 plus chromophores and iron 3 plus chromophores. And the more iron 3 plus we have, the darker it gets. So having 3 plus equals more money. Probably the most valuable type of aquamarine out there today is called Santa Maria aquamarine. And it comes from a place called Santa Maria in Brazil, where there must be a lot of iron 3 plus in the pegmatites that are producing the aquamarine. There tends to be a pleochroism with respect to the color on aquamarine, and a lot of the barrels actually, where along the length of the C-axis, here's our C-axis, you get really strong blue. But then along this axis, you get more of a light a light green. And so if we're looking to cut a gemstone that's going to be blue, we might put the gem, like we'd try to like facet our rough to cut a stone in this kind of position to take advantage of that strong blue coloration. All right, so that's some information about aquamarine colors. Some other facts about aquamarine is it, it tends to be eye clean. That means there are no inclusions in good Aquamarine. This is not going to be the case for emerald. Another thing is it is almost all heat treated. So let's say it tends to be heated or heat treated. You can heat it between, let's say, 250 to 700 degrees C after it comes out of the ground, a light blue color. And, or even like, so what will end up happening, let's say it's light blue or yellowish or even brownish barrel. And if you heat it at those temperatures, you're gonna get the aquamarine blue that you want. And this is an acceptable treatment. It is essentially undetected. It does make the stones, or undetectable, let's say. It makes the stones less valuable, but there's nothing that the industry can do because they can't tell if it has been heated or not. Most of barrel is found in pegmatites. or nearby alluvial settings, right, where it's eroded out of a pegmatite and is now in a river. And then I guess the last thing we could say about aquamarine is that the best source in the world is Brazil. That is where most of it is coming from. Pakistan and China, they have really good sources as well. In the U.S., we do have some as well. Let's just say, let's go Rocky Mountains in the US. There's a TV show that goes into gemstones and sometimes 
it talks about Mount Antero in Colorado as a source. The strongest market, so this is where this is like the source. The market is actually not the United States, maybe strangely enough. It's Japan and then Asia in general and then Europe because the U.S. kind of got distracted by topaz for the blue color. And so we're not a big market for aquamarine. The next gemstone to get into, we're just kind of going through these fairly fast, is going to be Heliodor. Heliodor is the yellow version of beryl. It's not, um, it's actually much more rare than aquamarine. We're going to put this here. It's a golden yellow color. And it is colored by iron 3 plus. That is the chromophore that gives it the color. Heat treating and irradiation will strengthen the colors. And so sometimes, maybe oftentimes, will let's say deepen color. We'll go from a light yellow to more golden color with heat treatment. And once again, this treatment is um, undetectable. And so it is very common. Brazil is the most common source of this material as well. Brazil is source. There's not all that much written about Heliodor. I think it's a stunning gemstone and far underappreciated. Morganite is another that used to be underappreciated, but then something happened in our fashion industry where the color of peach and light pink, I don't know exactly what color it is, but kind of a pinkish color, became really popular about five years ago. And so Morganite all of a sudden went from being not worth much to being worth, like you couldn't get enough of it. It is colored by a chromophore of manganese. It was named after an American. Maybe you've heard about this as a company. There was a businessman back in the early 1900s who loved gemstones. His name was J.P. Morgan. And gemologists back then loved how he was giving money to them. And so they called the pink barrel Morganite, named after him. So let's say this, um, that it has recently become fashionable. And this fashion, of course, could go out of style and it could return to more obscurity. But it's here for now. The um, source again, you know where it is? It's Brazil. Source is Brazil. And it's the pegmatites in Brazil. There are so many places. It used to be said that you could go to Brazil, dig a hole in the ground, and you would have to find barrel inside of it. That's how much of it is there. Most of the material is actually found in really big pieces. Like, let's say like crystals are like five pounds each. Really big crystals are found, and then they have to be cut into smaller pieces. Cut into smaller pieces for jewelry. That's not true for most gemstones right, where the bigger is better. Here it's so big, you, you actually have to cut it smaller. So well, how many other colors do we have? We just had, uh, let's D. This is red barrel. Red barrel is the most rare of them all. In fact, it only occurs in one place in the world, and that is in the state of Utah. It's a place called the Wa Wa Mountains in Utah, where it occurs inside of a rhyolite which is not a rock type we've talked about there. So it occurs as these really small crystals in rhyolite, a very strange type of occurrence. It's, it can't be heat treated. It's not heat treated. And in fact, it's so rare, it hasn't been mined for over 20 years. So let's just say this. Let's go rare, very rare hasn't been mined in 20 years, we don't need to write that down. And so maybe let's just put down, it's a specialty stone for collectors. It's not something that you or me ever get a chance to get our hands on. Specialty stone for collectors. And then the last type is Goshenite. Snore, it's clear. It used to be used for like reading glasses, but no one really cares about that. Let me just put a picture in and we can look at this. And as we finish up, let's make sure we can identify each of these different colors. Clear, Goshenite, yellow, Heliodor, pink, Morganite, 
another pink, morganite. Whoa, stunning blue aqua, red barrel, emerald, Ugh. green barrel, also green barrel. We didn't talk about green barrel, but that's when it's not blue enough to be aquamarine and not green enough to be emerald. It's kind of caught in that weird in-between. So that's an image from GIA. Here's a final image of a stunning blue color from a, my favorite gem source, which is called Omi Prive. These guys sell fascinating and stunning. If you ever just want to see really beautiful jewelry, go take a look at what Omi Prive has. There's one of the sapphires that they have for sale. Sapphires? I meant aqua.